Hey Ecofictologists, my name is Lovis and today I want to review New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson, which is a book that you've probably seen on every single ecofiction or climate fiction list you've looked at. Kim Stanley Robinson is an incredibly popular and prolific author and is one of the big names in ecofiction. He refers to his books as being optopian, which is basically that he takes a snapshot of where we might be if we were to work towards a utopia. He says utopia is a trajectory and not a destination, so as long as we are moving towards a more positive future, a more sustainable future where we're more in balance with the environment and with nature, then we are working towards a utopia. We're in a utopian society. And if that sounds confusing to you, then I think you should check out my other videos on all the opias for more detail. There are more than you would expect. Often in speculative ecofiction, when we look to the future, we see a very dystopian way of life, and these narratives are used as a warning to say, watch out, if we don't change our ways, this is where we might end up. And what I like about Kin Stanley Robinson's work is that it says, yes, this is where we might end up, but this is how we might adapt, and actually it's not the apocalypse. So even though this book is heavy in messages about climate change, it doesn't leave you feeling depressed. So if that is something that scares you off of reading ecofiction, that you think is going to be one big downer, then maybe these kinds of narratives are a good place to start. So put your finance hats on, ecofictologists, you're gonna need them. And let's get into it. First up is a spoiler-free summary. This book follows many different characters, I think there are eight different narrative threads, um, each focusing on a character that plays a different role in society from all kinds of different strata. And though they each contribute to the overall plotline, they each also have their own plotlines, which makes this book very multifaceted and varied. We've got Wall Street and financial maneuverings, we've got political intrigue and tactics, We've got polar exploration and the idea of assisted migration or um, translocation of species. And we've even got like a treasure hunt for buried gold. It all takes place in a flooded New York in the year 2140. And all the characters live in the MetLife Tower skyscraper, which connects all the different narrative threads together and pulls them like gravity into this overarching plot line. I like the diverse spread of characters and how they all link together. I like that each one is the perfect person for something in the main plot, um, but that they do each all have their own plot lines and their own arcs. The story is set in a time when climate change has really gained the upper hand and sea level has risen, I think, 50 feet from where it is today, leaving most of New York underwater. So transportation happens in boats, on canals or on uh, sky bridges instead of pavements or streets. Residents have adapted to their new surroundings, but they're always aware of the dangers of this semi-aquatic life. Um, the way we build has to change, the way we trade, travel, all of it. Funnily enough, one of the book's greatest assets is also one of its... Weakness isn't really the right word, but something that makes it less accessible to many people, in my opinion. Um, and it all comes down to how it's used. Kim Stanley Robinson really dives deep into this financial stuff, um, and the way that that's received depends on the reader and their interest in that financial stuff. I love the feeling of future realism that this book has because of the amount of detail that's in it. It's one of those funny situations where the more information and detail a person has, the more informed they are, the more that you trust that they know what they're talking about, even though you have no way of knowing whether any of it is correct, because it is so far out of your field of expertise. At least for me. New York 2140 probably has more information on Wall Street, the stock market, and finance in general than I think I ever wanted to know. Um, but it does really give you a very clear idea of how a flooded city's economy might have to respond in terms of the housing market or risk assessment or insurance. How do you insure buildings when you live in a flooded New York? What value does that land have when everywhere is a flood risk? And who owns the land that is now underwater? 
After reading this book, I do feel like I have a clearer picture of one possible future and what we might have to do to adapt. However, I am not a finance nerd. I am an ecology nerd. So sometimes things got a little overwhelming. I don't mind things going over my head. It happens a lot, but I would still like to be able to reach up and touch them. You know what I mean? Some of this stuff went so far over my head that it just kind of went in one ear and out the other. Like I don't have the tools to be able to actually assimilate or understand the information that you're giving me. But I think Kim Stanley Robinson is fully aware that he wrote quite a high level book. Um, in one interview that he gave, he said that he had a conversation with his agent where he said, I want to write a book about finance and economics. And his agent said, that is a terrible idea. But how about you write a book where finance and economics plays a main role in the plot? And that is exactly what New York 2140 feels like. It feels like a book that was written in order to explore finance and economics, which is fine because you should write about what you're passionate about and what you're interested in because that passion will connect with the reader even if that reader is someone like me who usually switches off when the conversation turns to finance. That passion is what pulled me through the story even though I don't think I actually learned or retained anything about finance or economics. <laughs> and when finance is weaved into the plot and used as a technique or a tool to create suspense and make the plan sound more clever and technical, I think that's great. And there is so much to know for those bits to make sense so that they don't seem like a deus ex machina, something that just appears to solve all of your problems, that info dumps throughout the story are kind of necessary. <laughs> I think this book can really access several audience niches. I think it will really appeal to people who don't want to dive all the way into an eco-fiction novel where the ecological message is so strong. Because the plot here, even though, yes, New York in the year 2140 looks the way it does because of climate change, and one of our characters does look at assisted translocation of species, um, the main plot is about financial maneuverings and political intrigue. I think it's also great for people who don't normally read a lot of sci-fi because um, while it is set in the future and while there are new technologies and new, new ways of life, um, the plot itself doesn't actually hinge on those new technologies. The, all the finance stuff that the plot revolves around probably exists now and Kim Stanley Robinson has just projected it forward. If you listen to interviews with Kim Stanley Robinson or if he's on a panel with other authors, um, he will invariably mention that capitalism is everything that is wrong with the world. He's very knowledgeable about it and he has weaved it into New York 2140 as well, this idea of dismantling a capitalist way of life. He links the impact of climate change with what he sees as centuries of destructive economic policy and um, points out that Climate change doesn't only affect our ecosystems and our environment, but also how our society is structured and our economy. Throughout the book, there are chapters written by the citizen, um, which are just an excuse to rant, really, about how society has failed to change to respond to the climate crisis. And sometimes they feel a bit much because the rest of the book feels like such a rallying cry. Like, no, we didn't respond in time and um, now we live in a flooded New York, but there is still something we can do. And these chapters by the citizen just feel like such downers. But maybe that's why the rest of the book feels so optimistic, because it's pointing out that, yeah, maybe we don't change right away, and maybe we continue living our unsustainable, wasteful, capitalist lives until the year 2140. But it also says, even if we only change in a hundred years, there is still something we can do to save something of the planet. So that's all I've got for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this review of New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it, so leave those in the comments below. And as always, I am open to all kinds of suggestions. If you have book suggestions for me, or if you would like me to discuss a certain topic on my channel, please let me know. And if you would like to explore ecofiction in a safe and supportive community, why not join me and uh, Mary Woodbury from Dragonfly Eco over on our Discord server called Rewilding Our Stories. Link is in the description below.
And if you like what I do and would like to support me, then head on over to patreon.com slash ecofictology and become a patron for only a small amount a month and collect some perks along the way. It's a small amount to you, but it buys me the next book that I review on this channel and it helps support a wonderful marine conservation organization called Love the Oceans who are doing great work in Mozambique. So happy reading and I'll see you next week, ecofictologists.